Hi guys and welcome to our video for activity 2. This week in lecture we talked about measures of central tendency and finding percentiles when using our distributions, right? So either we're going to have a simple frequency distribution in which we're looking at some cumulative frequency at a particular score, right, divided by the total number of people in that um, sample, right? And meaning sample size and then we multiply it by 100 to create a percentage okay if we're working in a grouped frequency distribution right we have this fanciful equation um, if you need to review what each of the variables mean in this equation you can refer back to the lecture we'll briefly go over this during the activity video um, so hopefully the application of actually putting stuff into the equation will help you a little bit in knowing how the equation works. Okay, um, These two equations will be on the exam, Okay, but just know in the equation that's given on the exam, you're just going to be given something that looks like this. So you won't have the percentage part listed. Okay, So you need to be familiar with the structure understand when to use it and what it produces for an outcome. We're going to start with spreadsheet number one, which is looking at a swim team, okay, so, or members of a swim team, I should say, okay, and these members are listed over here, okay, um, Lauren, Emily, Rachel, Jasmine, and Kylie, and what these individuals um, have are different race times calculated for certain strokes and what we're trying to do in this spreadsheet is figure out what percentile they would land at based on a distribution of scores that were collected at a swim meet right so if these individuals participated in each of these different strokes at a swim meet how would they compare to everybody else who participated Right? Remember, percentiles are going to give us some percentage at or worse than, right? or the percentage of people who performed as well as or worse than the given individual score. Okay? So in order to calculate our percentiles, we need to know the cumulative frequency right, that occurs at the given score. Right? In other words, we need to know how many people performed worse than or equal to, right, the given raw score um, of the swimmer that we're evaluating. So, you can see here, right, cumulative frequency is going to play in calculating the percentile, right? And in addition to knowing the cumulative frequency, we also need to know how many people we measured for the given freestyle time, right, in the distribution of uh, swim meet participants. So, we're going to make a total frequency calculation here, okay, and we're going to put equals. This is where a new function will come in. You can type count, okay, and then you're just going to insert a range of data. We're going to start with our freestyle time, so all of the cells that have data in them, and that will give us the total number of cells that have values in them. So that's what the count function does. The other way you can count right cells without having to like count each of them individually is highlighting a cell range and you'll notice the count right or the the number of cells that have data. You can see there's a little note at the bottom here, right? Number of cells that have data or that contain data is going to be 66, which matches our value up here. Okay, so we'll come back to this number. What we now want to find is the cumulative frequency. So I'm, on, I'm going to delete um, these two columns first so you can see how I created them because you guys don't have them in your spreadsheet. Um, so if you remember from last week, if you want to insert columns, right, you click on the column to the right of where you want your new column inserted. So I'm going to click on column H. I right click or two finger click and I press insert, right? That'll insert a column to the left of where I have highlighted, 
Okay, for our purposes, we're going to have a cumulative frequency column and a percentile column. I like colors, so you saw previously I colored mine. So you just highlight the cells you want to change colors. And then in the paint can on the home tab, you can change what color is shown. Okay, and then all I did from here, I'll show you if I delete these real quick. All you do to copy and paste this into or in between each of the different stroke times is you just highlight the cells that you just made. Control C or Command C, right? And then from K, you can highlight that column, two finger click, and you say, I want to insert the copied cells by shifting the cells to the right. And now you have two columns inserted. So you'll do that in between each of your stroke times, or sorry, each of your different strokes. And then remember, if you double click on the sides of the columns, you can expand them so that the labels aren't chopped off. And for the purposes of this uh, particular spreadsheet, I'm just going to close in the widths a little bit so we can see more at one time. Okay, so our variable is time and in order to find a percentile or start calculating our cumulative frequency we need to know what end of the distribution represents the worst scores and what end of the distribution represents the best scores. Okay, not necessarily greater or lesser, right? We always speak in terms of worse or better, right? And the, the value of worse or better is dependent on you, the researcher, okay? So if we're looking at time for a swim race, right? People who usually come in first place or do better have lower times, right? They swam the, rec or the, the required distance faster, Okay, so in this case, you'll notice that all of our strokes for the participants that we collected, right, in the swim meet were ordered from fastest time to slowest time. Okay, so technically the top up here is going to be our best scores, and the bottom down here would be considered our worst scores. Okay, that's going to come into play when we calculate our cumulative frequency for Lauren. Okay, remember percentiles are equivalent to or worse than a given raw score. So we're going to calculate this by using our count if function, right? We used this last week, and this particular function is going to return the number of values, right, that are matching a certain criteria that we specify, okay? So we're wanting to, we're looking at freestyle time, right? Her raw score is 48.3. So we want to see how many scores, right, within this given range of data are worse than or equal to her score, okay? Worse than meaning the numbers get bigger. So our criteria will be how many values are greater than or equal to and, right, including this raw score value, okay? So we can press enter, and we see that we have 61, okay? So we can double check this to make sure that it's right, okay? Lauren's time was 48.3 seconds. If we go over here, we find one, two, three, four, five. She would kind of land between these two scores here, okay? So if five people performed better than she did, meaning they had uh, faster times, right? If we take the total frequency, 66, minus those five scores that did better, we end up getting 61. Okay, so that's the other way you could do it, um, or calculate the cumulative frequency. But I think this is probably the simplest way that we're going to operate. Okay, we can then use this same equation set up to calculate the cumulative frequency for where each of the individuals below will fall in, okay? The first thing we have to remember though is that if we're copying this formula downwards, that means all cell references are also going to shift down. 
And there is one cell reference we don't want to shift, and that is the cell range, right? So in order to not have our um, rows shift each time, meaning this box would keep moving down one cell, we have to freeze the row by inserting a dollar sign in front of the row reference, which is the number, okay? This one is fine because the reference or the raw score reference for that given range needs to change because we're calculating the cumulative frequency for each person as we go down the rows. So this should be good to copy, okay? And we can click um, or double click to make sure our entire data range is still good, okay? And the reference of the raw score is still good, okay? So they should be the cumulative frequencies, all right? The basically the position in the total number of people measured that each of these raw scores landed at. Okay. So to calculate the percentile, we go back to this function here, right? Where we take the cumulative frequency at the particular score, which we just calculated, divide it by the total number of people who were collected in that sample, and then we multiply it by 100. So this is just inserting a calculation, right? It's going to be equals the cumulative frequency for a given raw score, okay, divided by total number of people measured times 100, okay? Simple as that. Now, we do want to copy this function downwards. So what do we need to freeze? Think about it, this reference here for our total frequency, right? And again, if we're copying downwards, that means the row reference is going to shift, which essentially means if we copy this from Lauren to Emily's box, this total frequency box reference is going to shift down and there's no data there. That's problematic, right? So instead, we're going to insert a dollar sign in front of the row reference for our total frequency box. Okay, we press enter and then we should be able to calculate the percentages or percentiles for each person. Okay, you could double click to make sure your references are good. And if we look, since Jasmine is highlighted, right, this would essentially translate that for Jasmine, okay, her time out of the distribution of freestyle times, right, or in comparison to the distribution of freestyle times, she scored at or better than 93.94% of the rest of the distribution or the rest of the sample that was collected, okay? So from here, it's actually pretty easy to do the rest of the calculations because your formatting is pretty much there, right? All you have to do is copy the first two, um, like, cumulative frequency percentile calculations that you made, paste them into the next stroke, okay? And you'll notice there are some problems, but easily fixable, okay? If you double click on the cumulative frequency, you'll notice the reference on how you're calculating the cumulative frequency for a given raw score is correct, but the range is wrong, right? We're calculating a cumulative frequency for backstroke and our range is on butterfly. So similar to last week, you just drag your reference over and we'll do the same thing for the percentile, right? Where our reference should be the same, but all we're missing is the total frequency. So in this case, that's pretty easy. You just type the count function and then highlight all of the backstroke times, okay? And then you should notice the percentile part kind of fills in itself, okay? So from here, all you have to do is highlight those two calculations, double click, boom, bop, bam, now we have our calculations, right? And you're basically going to do the same thing for each of the strokes. So I'll do it for brush stroke. We need to get our total frequencies, right? And we'll do our total frequency for butterfly. Again, using the count function, okay? And then basically from there, 
again, the process is that you copy and paste, right? And then make sure your reference to your raw score is where you want it. And then this one, we're calculating brush stroke. So we just have to make sure our reference area or range is on brush stroke. Double click to make sure your percentile references are correct. And then we can paste this down here. Okay. Last one for butterfly. I know I'm going fast, but all the procedures are in here. So you can feel free to go at your own pace and then check back to see if your answers match mine. Okay. All right. So that's kind of like this first part here. Okay. Now at the end, we want to add up each person's individual times to see who would have done all four strokes in a row the fastest. Okay, so we want, woo, too far. Okay, we're gonna add another column that's gonna say sum time, right? So the sum of all of their times put together in seconds. And then we also wanna take a sum of each per person's percentile ranks to see who would have been fastest just based on percentile values. So we're also going to add a column and just put some percentile or some percentage, okay? Now, in order to calculate a sum, we press equals, okay? And then we can do this a couple of different ways. I'll show you both ways and then you just figure out which one you like better. The first one is using a sum function, okay? So again, if we're adding up all of their times, okay? You click on the first time, you put a column, and you'll notice that becomes a solid line. Okay, now the equation is asking for number two, right, which would be backstroke. You put a comma, breaststroke, comma, butterfly. Enter. Some time has been calculated, right? And we get 218.3 seconds, okay? The other way that we can calculate this, I'm just going to delete that real quick, is if you put in your own calculation for adding time. So in this case, we would say equals freestyle plus backstroke plus, right? Basically does or should do the same thing. Look, we got the same number. So you can pick which way you want to add up your numbers. Okay, from here, we want all of our references to shift down based on the people that we're working with. So we can just copy that function down. And then we need to do the same thing to add up the percentiles, right? So I'm going to use the sum function for this one. And we're going to say Lauren's percentile for freestyle plus her percentile for backstroke plus her percentile for breaststroke plus her percentile for butterfly. Okay. And again, to change a cell reference, you just put a comma so that you hold um, the reference you just clicked on. Okay, and then we can copy this downwards. So, now we have sums of all of their times put together and a sum of their percentages. So, if we now go to the answer sheet, okay, the first parts A through C, I want you to round your answers to the nearest hundredth of a percentile, okay? And we've had, I have these cells formatted so they give you that already. Um, but you're going to put in what these individuals um, percentiles were for the given stroke. Okay. And then for part C and D, you're going to have to use some critical thinking. Okay. And apply some concepts that you learned last week to figure out how to organize your data to answer the questions that um, I posed here. Okay, so we're saying based on the sum of percentile rankings, who might perform best at a medley race, right? Considering all of the strokes and the percentile. So you have to think what the percentiles mean when they're added up together, right? Does a higher sum percentile mean that a swimmer did better or worse than a person who has a lower sum percentile, okay? 
You're also going to do the same thing looking at stroke times. So again, critically think, does a higher sum of stroke times, does that amount to something or to a, a total sum that is better or worse than somebody who has a lower sum? Okay, and I'll give you a hint on how to do this. Okay, I'm going to add name here just so that the program doesn't freak out. Okay, but we're going to say from name all the way to our sum of percentages. Okay, I'm going to add a filter. It's up to you to figure out what to do with that filter if you use the filter right, to figure out who would, um, who, who you would organize, right, as the best performer based on percentile ranking and then also based on stroke times, okay? So this is the part where I've carried you through the spreadsheet and now you have to apply some critical thinking to figure out how to answer these two questions, okay? Next spreadsheet is our student fitness testing. Okay, so let's look at our instructions for that one, which are here. Okay. Um, all right. So now we are working with a simple frequency distribution, right? We have a database of student fitness testing that we've conducted over the years. And a few students from your current class want to know how they compare to students from the previous years. Right? So using data from previous years, we're going to figure out, let's say Terry. Terry does 31 push-ups. How does that number 31 compare to the total number right, of push-ups that have been calculated in previous class students? Okay. So same procedure as before. We're going to create a cumulative frequency column for each exercise. Okay. For both the simple frequency distribution and the student table. Okay, and then we're going to calculate the percentiles for each exercise um, based on the person that we are looking at. Okay, so you'll notice this first column is um, basically like our raw score column. Okay, so this would be equivalent to like the pull ups um, spreadsheet we did last week. Right, in activity one, where we started at three, we ended at 20, right? So this represents how many um, of whatever exercise a person completed. And then these columns over here represent how many people were able to complete the given number, right, of the particular exercise. So that's why they're kind of scattered about, okay? I usually have people get a bit confused with this. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to insert some columns, okay? These are going to be cumulative frequency columns for each respective sport, okay? And we also have instructions to add a cumulative frequency column in between each of our exercises. If you need to pause because I'm going too fast, that is totally fine, okay? So I'm going to, again, just so our numbers kind of stand out a little bit better, I'm going to make these cumulative frequency columns yellow. And then similar to my previous spreadsheet, my cumulative frequencies in each of these are going to be green. If you're wondering how I just highlighted two columns at once, you highlight the first column, Hold Command if you're on a Mac, hold Control if you're doing Windows, and then you can highlight the additional cells, and then you just create the change that you invoke um, based on that highlighted section. Okay, so anyways, to calculate cumulative frequency, remember in a simple frequency distribution, okay, we are going to start from the worst score and then work our way towards the best score, right? So this is just a different way of calculating our cumulative frequency, okay, because we already have a frequency column built up. So just to highlight, the method we used in this spreadsheet would not work in this spreadsheet, 
okay? Because these values don't represent raw data, these values again represent frequencies of people who performed these numbers of push-ups, okay? So these aren't your raw scores of the individuals, they're frequencies of the students that you've collected, okay? So the way that we start this is we say zero push-ups, right, would be the worst, meaning people couldn't do one push-up or they didn't do any push-ups, right? And then we work our way up, right, number to like 51 in this case is our highest score, so 51 would be the best, right? So similar to how we did in class, um, the first cumulative frequency is simply going to equal the frequency at the worst score, okay? From there we say the cumulative frequency at the next best score, right, would be the existing cumulative frequency that we've already calculated plus whatever the frequency is at the current row or the current raw score, right, being one push-up. Okay, so we're adding three to four and we get seven. Okay, we can copy this downwards Right, just so we see step by step, this would be adding current cumulative frequency plus the frequency of people who completed two push ups. So then we say people who completed two push ups or less equals 11. Right, so we can copy this all the way down, and we don't need to go that far, we only need to go to 51. We notice we have a total number of 350 students that have been collected, okay? We'll do the same thing for the pull-ups. So again, we start at the worst score being zero, calculate the frequency at that worst score, and then we add on the frequency of the next score, and then we can just copy this down to the highest score achieved. Again, 350 students have been calculated. Same thing with squats, right? Start with the uh, frequency at the worst score, and then we add, right, the next best score's frequency, and copy down to the best score that was recorded. Again, 350 is our total sample size. So now what we want to do is we want to find, right, what cumulative frequency matches up for Terry. Okay, so Terry performed 31 push-ups. So we need to know how many people performed at or worse than Terry's score of 31. An easy way we can do this, right, is just add up um, our values here. Okay. Um, or we find the, sorry, not add up. Um, we find, right, Terry's score, and then the cumulative frequency should be listed in that column, okay? So Terry's score was 31. We find 31, we go to push-ups, and we see that the cumulative frequency that performed at or worse than 31 is 307. So that would include pretty much everyone from 31 down to zero, okay? So 307 people are in this range. So we can just put 307 in that box, okay? Same thing for Julian, so we'll find a raw score of 40. We find the cumulative frequency is 339. Okay, so this part you guys insert manually. Naomi was at 18, cumulative frequency is 158, okay? And then I'll let you guys work from Sergio... Um, and Jane, and then fill in your cumulative frequencies for your pull-ups and your squats. All right, so you should have calculated your cumulative frequencies. And remember, the main goal of this is to find the percentiles that each of these persons raw scores for their exercises, right, and how those match up with previous students. So similar to our last spreadsheet, we're going to also insert a percentile column okay and similar to the last one I'm also going to change the color and then you can just copy and insert okay 
And then I'm going to readjust these columns so they're not so wide. Okay, and now we have a percentile area to calculate per person. So remember, percentile for some type of simple frequency distribution is going to be based on the cumulative frequency divided by the total number of people that were measured times 100. Okay, so in this case, at the end, right, of each cumulative frequency column for each of our exercises, we have 350 people, right? The number at the best score, the cumulative frequency at the best score should be the total number of people that you've measured. So to calculate the percentile, we say cumulative frequency divided by how many people were measured times 100. Okay, and we get some percentile. If you want to change, right, in the answer sheet for this particular spreadsheet, I want you to round to the nearest hundredth, oh, sorry, fitness testing, sorry, spreadsheet number two, you're rounding to the nearest whole percentile. So the way that you can change the decimals in here is if you click on number, and then this one will increase the decimal, this one decreases the decimal. So if I click on this, you'll notice the values go down and it rounds appropriately. So if 0.7, right, should round up to the nearest whole percent, which is 88, okay? So then this should be copyable downwards, right? And you can double check, make sure your reference is correct. Okay, and then basically we're just gonna do this for each of our exercises. So you just copy and paste. Again, you can double click. Hello. Double click in any column, make sure your reference is correct, right? And then you're good to go. So from here, you should be able to answer these questions, okay? Moving on to spreadsheet number three. Let me go back to my instructions. Okay, spreadsheet number three, as you can see, is a grouped frequency distribution, right? We're working with different groupings here. So your classmates, right, have given you a group frequency distribution table summarizing all of the data they've gathered from a VO2 max test on college students. And your goal is to see, is this random collection of students, okay, or using this random collection of students, you're going to um, figure out where certain people would land, okay? Um, so you're given a cross-country runner, you took their VO2 max, and you're trying to see at what percentile in this distribution, right, of a thousand people, um, where does that person land based on their um, VO2 max value? Okay, now I have a note down here. Okay, a thousand person sample your classmate found is a mix of people from different sports and backgrounds. You are comparing the values of three individuals who from your experience should be in the high average and low areas. Okay, and basically you're trying to see if these people's percentiles match up where they should be if this sample actually represents um, most college students, okay? So, I know that sounds like a lot, but what we're going to do is we're going to first create two columns that separate our upper and lower bounds, right? Because we know from this, um, formula, we need to know the lower bound. So it's better if we isolate it from the rest of our values, okay? So I'm going to, um, I'm going to insert a row. And we're going to say this is the lower bound, this is our upper bound column. Okay. We're going to start at 30, and then you'll notice we increase in increments of 5. Okay, so remember you create a pattern, and one more. Then you can copy it. Okay, so each of your numbers should be counted by 5. And then we can do the same thing, 34.9 to 39, oops, 39.9. .9. We 
We've identified a pattern and we can copy downwards, okay? Frequency we don't touch. We do, however, need to calculate a cumulative frequency, right? Because that's part of our function. So we'll create a cumulative frequency column. Remember, we start at the worst score and work our way to the best score when we're calculating cumulative frequencies. So if you think in terms of VO2, even if you have no context on what values of VO2 are, you can always reference the people, right? We know high VO2 is considered a 68, low VO2 is considered 36. So the lower the number, the worse their VO2 max is, right? So that, that in that respect, we can kind of figure out where to start based on the worst score. So we'll calculate this similar to how we calculated the fitness test scores since we're already given a frequency, right? So we can say at the lowest frequency, our cumulative frequency is equal to the frequency of this worst group, okay? We then add the frequency that we just calculated to the frequency of the next best group, okay? And we do this all the way down to our final group. And we notice we have a sample of a thousand people, which should match up with the information that we found, okay? Now we need to see what the percentiles are for these three individuals, right? So we have cross country, a tennis player, and a video gamer. So we'll just refer to them as that, right? We'll say cross country, tennis player, and our gamer, okay? We have their raw scores, right, or their regular VO2, um, which in our formula is X, so we could also label this as X, okay? So raw score or X, I'm just gonna put X, that way you have a frame of reference, okay? And those scores were 68, 47, and 36. Okay. And then using the information from this table and our formula that is given, we're going to calculate their percentile. Okay, so I'll go back up here for reference so you can kind of follow along. Now. When you insert this formula, you have to be very careful that you're enclosing the appropriate information. Because remember, order of operations is important and there's a lot of stuff going on in the top here. Okay, so what I like to do for this one, if you wanna memorize this, you can. If not, I'll go through the logical processing as well. But you should have four parentheses. Okay, and you'll notice that each parentheses color changes, and you'll see how different components are enclosed, um, and what order they're going to be added, subtracted, multiplied, etc., based on the color. Okay, so essentially the innermost uh, parenthesis is going to be calculated first, and that's our um, raw score minus the lower bound value in which that raw score lands. Okay. So, for our cross-country person, our raw score is X, okay? We subtract that from the lower bound of the grouping that this raw score falls into. So, 68 is going to land between 65 and 69.9, so the lower bound reference would be 65, okay? We put a parenthesis on that because this numerator is going to be calculated before dividing it by the interval size, which if you recall is the difference from two adjacent lower bounds or two adjacent upper bounds. So the easiest way I like to look at it is from lower bound. So the difference between 30 and 35, right? Or you can use 35 and 40, doesn't matter, right? The interval size should be five. So we divide this subtracted area, right, or those two values, we subtract that by the interval size 5 and then close the parentheses. So essentially we're calculating this portion first, okay? 
We then are going to multiply by the frequency of the grouping that 68 falls into, right? Which would be 67, okay? Multiplication automatically comes before our addition, so we should be good, right? And we just add C, which is the cumulative frequency of the grouping that is worse than the group where our raw score lands, and that would be this column here. Okay, remember worse than indicates the scores for VOT max are getting smaller. So this encloses our numerator, and you'll see we now have a red parenthesis, which matches this red parenthesis there. Okay, so all that's left is to divide by the total number of individuals that we've collected. You can use a cell reference at 1,000, or you can just type 1,000, okay, close that parentheses, and then last but not least, we should have to multiply by 100 to actually get a percentage. So there we have it, okay, and I can add this, you guys can add the 100 on here if you want, it doesn't matter, it should be intuitive that if you don't multiply by 100, you don't get a percentage, okay. So the easiest way that we can fix this is to just copy the function. We're not done yet. Okay. If we look at the tennis player now, right, you'll notice the references are not correct. So at this point, we're just going to be, oh no, at this point, we're just going to be adjusting the boxes based on the raw score value. Okay. So raw score is the first thing that goes in. And then we need the lower bound of the group in which that raw score falls. So 47 would be between 45 and 49.9. So this red box should shift there. Okay. We then divide by 5, which is our interval size. So that's a constant. doesn't need to change. Uh, multiply by the frequency of the group that 47 falls into. And then add the cumulative frequency of the group that is worse than where 47 falls into, okay? Again, divide by total number of people in the sample and multiply by 100, and you get your percentile for the tennis player, okay? So, last one, 36, you guessed it, lower bound is 35, and we adjust our boxes accordingly. All right, now let's go to our answer sheet. Okay, rounding your answers to the nearest hundredth of a percentile, and you're going to first list the percentiles that you've calculated, easy peasy lemon squeezy. Now you're going to answer part D, and this is what it is. The thousand person sample your classmate found is a mix of people from different sports and backgrounds. Okay, you want to know is that sample representative of college students? By comparing your known high, middle, and low VO2 values to the percentiles that actually came out. Okay, so this is this is our calculated percentile based on the sample. Right? Let's say the expected percentile is something that we add in. Okay? So just ballparking, right? It doesn't have to be exact. But if you're looking at our instructions, right? This note down here says from your experience, you know these values should be high, average, and low, right? High, let's say we're looking at maybe 75% or more, okay? Average should be around the 50, uh, 50 percentile mark, okay? Low, let's say, is like less than 20%, less than 25%, whoops press some numbers twice, okay? So this is based on, you know these individuals, their raw scores should be high, average, and low. Based on the calculated percentile, right, 
compared to where you would expect the person to be, do you think this sample is actually representative of the population of college students? Okay, and in the answer sheet, you will give your reasoning um, to why you think what you do. Okay. All right. Next spreadsheet. We have a bunch of student values. And um, this is the wrong page. All right. What we want to do is we are going to um, calculate measures of central tendency, so mean, median, and mode for each variable within the data set. Now, most of this you guys are going to do on your own. I will give you a couple of examples, okay? Um, so the first thing, find mean, median, mode of each group, or for um, each variable, okay? So we'll start with that. And in uh, the instruction sheet, I give you certain functions that we haven't gone over yet, so you can look at that, okay? Um, and let's actually hold off on the mode for now. There isn't a formula in Excel that calculates the mode, so rather we're gonna use groups instead, okay? So we're gonna start by copying our labels, right? Mass, height, etc., and just paste them somewhere over here, okay? And then we'll have a column for our mean and our median calculations. So, you guys have calculated the mean. You did that last week. So, test your knowledge should be equals average. And then you insert a range of data in which you want to find that average. Okay. From here, since you're going to be copying, right, and calculating the average for each um, a consecutive column, we can just copy this calculation all the way down to squat, which is our last um, variable or test, right? You can double click on that, just, oops, double click just to make sure that your range is correct. Woohoo, success! All right, and then we want to calculate the median. It is as simple as equals median. What? Okay. And it's the same thing. You just insert the range. Ta-da. And then we paste. Okay. So now you have two measures of central tendency. We're then going to calculate mode groups. Okay. Um, so basically, we're going to be making a grouped frequency distribution, essentially. Okay, we're going to start with mass since that's the first um, variable or test or measurement that we made, right? And remember when we make a group frequency distribution, we have a lower end of our interval and an upper end of our interval as well as the frequency because remember modes count the highest frequency, okay? So I gave you guys specific instructions to follow, right, on how big your interval should be, okay, and where you're starting and where you're ending. So essentially, the start value should be um, the first lower bound number, and the ending value should be the last upper bound number, okay? Um, for mass, we're doing 73 to 82 based on an interval of 1. So the easiest way we can do this, I have a bad short-term memory, so 73, okay. Um, this one would be 74, or you can put 73.9. The way that I like to do it um, is just excluding this upper value when you use your count ifs function. Okay, so from here we'll have 74, 75, we've identified a pattern, and we can go up to 82, okay? So then we can say frequency 
should be count ifs, right? Returning some um, number of values, right? That meet a certain criteria. So we're in mass, right? So the first set of criteria is going to match this cell range. Okay, and we want our values to include 73. So we're going to say we want everything that is greater than or equal to the lower bound. Our second set of criteria is going to match, right, our first range. Whoops, B101. Okay, and then our second set of criteria is going to be all values in this range that are less than the upper bound, which is 74. So we just put less than and whoops and the cell reference for 74. Okay. Remember that when we copy this downwards, we don't want our cell range to shift by row. So we're going to insert some super awesome freezing dollar signs. You can laugh at me, it's okay. And then we're going to press enter. Now we have a cumulative frequency, or a frequency, of how many values in this range landed between 73 and 74. Okay? And so this should be copyable. I might have to move over. There we go. Okay, and then you just double check. Cell range is, dang it, why does it hate me? The cell range is where it should be. Our references are where they should be. We have successfully calculated the mode based on groupings, okay? Um, so that's how you're gonna calculate the mode groups using this information, okay? The last thing you guys are gonna do is I wanted to introduce you to um, interquartile ranges, which are an example of measures of variability and that's going to be in next week's lecture but this is the perfect data set to go over these measurements of variability and it's super easy okay so there's two functions that you can use to get the same result okay so briefly I mentioned what an interquartile range represents Okay, interquartile ranges are largely based off of percentiles in which we create each quartile, right? Think quartile quarter. So each quarter, each 25% is a new quartile. Q0 is the minimum value of the data set. Q1 would be at 25%, Q2 at 50%, 3 at 75, 4 at the max value, which would be the 100th percentile of that particular data set. Okay, so basically what the interquartile range is, is it's whatever the raw data value is at the 75th percentile minus the raw data value at the 25th percentile. So essentially we're taking the middle 50% of uh, the data we collect. Okay, so I'm going to do this down here and we'll use this first column for labeling. Um, so the first thing we need to know is, that was not helpful at all. What is Q3, right? Or what's at the 75th um, percentile? And then what value is at Q1 or the 25th percentile? And then we simply just take the difference between those two values to find our interquartile range, okay? So this is where you can use either the percentile function or the quartile function. And I've listed out how each of these are used. We'll also demonstrate here. So the first one I'm going to use is the percentile function. Okay. Um, we'll use uh, mass as our first example. So in this function, you're going to start typing percentile. And you'll notice there's um, an included and an excluded one. Just do the ink one, okay? It'll ask for an array, which is basically just the range of data that you're working in. You put a comma, and then you'll see it now asks for K. K is going to represent the percentile that you're looking for, right, as a value between 0 and 1. So instead of putting, like, 25%, you just put 
0.25. Okay, press enter and it gives you the raw score that would land. Oh, sorry, this is Q3. My bad. So you want the 75th percentile. Okay, so this will give you the raw score that lands at the 75th percentile in this set of data. Okay, we can use um, the quartile method on Q1 just so you see how um, they differ from each other. Okay, so instead of percentile, let's say we use the quartile ink, right? We're still going to have a range of data for mass. And then now you're seeing it's asking for the quartile that you're looking for. So you choose one, two, three, we're looking for one. So you literally just put a value of one and press enter and it'll give you the raw score value in that data set that would land at the first quartile. So I'm just going to <sighs> let's see. Uh... We're rounding to the nearest tenth of a percentile, so we need to adjust this value such that we're only rounding to the tenth, okay? And then our interquartile range is just Q3 minus Q1. Ha-ha, okay? So this is essentially saying that our middle 50% in the mass data that we collected ranges 2.5 kilograms. Okay, so it's a measure of spread. And again, we'll talk about this a little bit more um, when we go over this next week. So you can either practice inserting each of those calculations, ah, or we can just copy down. Okay, um, so then you're just going to fill in the last question with regards to mode and the interquartile range as well as the mode range for the GPA. Remember when we're asking for range, we are looking at the range of the highest frequency. So for mass, as an example, your mode range would be 78 to 79 kilograms because 24, right, is the highest frequency within this distribution. Okay. Last spreadsheet, you guys are doing fantastic, okay? So the goal is to introduce how SPSS is set up, um, how to change different settings within SPSS, and then how to calculate uh, different values that we've already calculated using um, a frequencies analysis and a means analysis. Okay, so I've given you guys the pathways here. Okay, and then um, basically what you want to do is look over the SPSS data that's been um, put into it, or look over the data that is in Excel, copy it into SPSS, okay, and then practice changing these values, um, and then we'll go through the frequencies analyses, the means analysis, and then I'll show you how to export your file to an alternative format doesn't necessarily have to be PDF okay um, but I'll show you how to do all the saving and this is the procedure you'll use for the rest of the semester so pay attention all right first we need to find SPSS now if you're working on a Windows computer you are going to uh, probably type it in the search bar so that it pops up if you have it saved to your desktop you can double click that way if you're on a Mac, you're going to press F4, and that should bring up your applications. You'll click in SPSS, right, and you'll just open the SPSS statistics program. It does sometimes take a while to pop up, so we will give it that time. And while we're giving it that time, we're going to look at this spreadsheet. Maybe. Oh, there it goes. I'm just going to close this so I get it out of my way. All right. So we're going to be using some information from last week with regards to the type of data we're looking at. Okay. So we have a legend here um, where we've categorized individuals based on their sex and based on the sport that they play. 
And each of these um, categories within these variables have been given values to make it easier to sort our individuals, right? So females are given a value of one, males are given a value of two, and then their respective sports each have a value that matches um, the sport that the person plays in, okay? We've calculated or measured their mile time, how many push-ups they can do, how many, or, um, and then how long they can hold a plank. Okay, so basically we're just going to copy and paste um, all of our data, including the variable names. Okay, copy those, and then we're going to open our data sheet in SPSS. I'm in the Pull these down so that my background isn't so messy. Okay, and get rid of that. And actually, I'm going to keep the Activity 2 data up here for reference. Okay, what you're going to do is click in the first box. Make sure it says Data View. That's very important. Okay, you're going to right click or two finger click, and you're going to paste with variable names. If you do not have this option, do not paste your data, okay? If you don't have the paste with variable names, you need to go back to your data set and copy the data without the variable names, okay? I'm hoping that nobody has that problem, but if you do, I can always make a video if you email me and ask for it, okay? So we'll paste variable names, and you'll notice, right, our first um, value up top is two, representing sex, sport, right, this kind of auto-filled in. What will happen if you aren't able to paste with variable names is that these uh, labels go into the first row, and it messes up the formatting for your variables. Okay, so the general setup of SPSS says that each row is representative of a subject. Okay, and each subject, all of their data or any information that we have on them goes in that respective row. Okay, so what we can do from here is um, highlight how the variables or change certain variable information. You want the type, this column here, everything should be numeric. Okay, that'll represent... Um, Pretty much any value that has a number, okay, is allowed to be in there. There are different options. We will never use those options. So just make sure this says numeric, okay? Width and decimals doesn't really matter, so don't worry about it. The label should match um, the tops, right, or the, that top row that you saw in your data view. And then we can assign values to a specific label. So let's click on um, sex first, okay? And this is where we're specifying our legend, basically, saying that when we see a number one, it's not some measured variable, right? Or it's not some measured value that we collected. It actually means a specific thing. So a value of one we know means female, okay? We add that in, and a value of 2 means that we have a male, okay? We're going to do the same thing for sport, right? So 1 is soccer, 2 is basketball, 3 is swimming, and 4 is lacrosse, okay? Once we've specified those, again, you don't need to really pay attention to any of these three columns. We do need to know the measure, though. And this will, um, actually, let me pull up the pop up. So when you have a numeric type of data, you should be given three options, nominal, ordinal, or scale. Okay, scale is going to be representative of ratio or interval data. Okay, so they're just kind of combined into one category in SPSS. So when we look at sex, right, we technically have categories, right? So that would be an example of nominal data. Sport would be the same thing. And then our mile time, push-ups, and plank time 
are all ratio data, right, or scale data, because they, um, if somebody had a score of zero, that would mean they didn't have a measurement for that particular uh, test, okay? Usually the default is scale. I like to change the variables just in case, okay? So now that we have that information pulled up, I'm going to pull up your instruction sheet so you can see where I'm getting this information from. Okay, these are your processes. Okay, you go back to the data view and then you should have um, options either up here or in uh, the Windows version. They should be within the data window. But again, if you need help with that, I always have an, uh, a Windows computer so I can show you on there. Okay. Um, any tests that we run in SPSS are always going to be under the Analyze tab. Okay. We're going to first do um, a frequencies analysis, which is going to be under Descriptive Statistics and Frequencies. Okay. Um, and then from here, basically this is just choose a variable to analyze. Okay. And then you're going to choose statistics on how you want to um, execute. So let's uh, let's say we're going to analyze all of these. How about that? The way that I did that just now is if you click on the top, press and hold shift to click at the bottom, and you just insert the variables over here. Okay? So what we're going to do is we say statistics. And then you'll notice you could calculate quartiles, you can calculate percentiles. Um, you can calculate your measures of central tendency. So I'm going to calculate the mean. Um, these are your measures of variability. So let's calculate standard deviation, variance. Um, and let's also do skewness and kurtosis. You don't know what these are yet, but you will. Okay. So let's say those are our five um, calculations. And that's what this says down here. Conduct a frequency analysis and choose five different calculations. These are my five. Okay. So I'm going to press continue. And then we don't really need to mess with any more of this. If you wanted to make a chart out of your frequency distributions, you could, right? So if you want to make a bar chart or histogram, those are ones that we've kind of played with already. Haven't really made histograms in Excel yet, but we've made bar charts and histograms are very similar. Um, but we're not gonna we're not gonna do any charts for now. We'll just say okay. And then you should get a separate output window. Okay, titled frequencies. Um, and basically what this shows is your statistics or your descriptive statistics or calculations that you requested, right? So mean, standard deviation, vari variance, um, your skewness calculations and your kurtosis calculations for each of the variables that you inserted into the frequencies analysis, okay? You then get frequency tables, which will tell you how many people, right? Or the frequency of females when you're categorizing your data by the variable of sex, right? Um, you can see how many people are in each sport based off of the variable of sport, okay? And then if you look at mile time, plank time, right, all of these, those are just going to be super, super long ones because we have ratio type data, okay? Um, so that's how you run a frequencies analysis. It's pretty easy, and it gives you some pretty good information, okay? The other analysis we're running is a means analysis. So we're going to go to analyze, compare means, and means. Okay, again, pretty easy. And then what we're going to do in this one is we're going to choose one independent variable and one dependent variable. Okay, and then choose the calculations um, five, right, that we want to execute. Preferably the same calculations as in the frequencies analysis, which I already knew, so I kind of helped you out. Okay, so remember that an independent variable usually has some sort of levels to it, right? Meaning there, there are categories that exist that um, you use to sort 
your sample, right? So as for, as for a, an independent variable, you could use sex or sport. So I'm going to use sport, okay? And then the dependent list is going to be representative of a dependent variable or a variable that was actually measured using some type of test. So let's say we're looking at push-ups, okay? So essentially the research question uh, here would be what is the effect of sports, right? Or what is the effect of what sport a person plays based on how many push-ups they can do, right? Or what's the effect of sport on push-up in the simplest of terms, okay? So from here we can say options, and then you'll see these are the statistics that'll be calculated. I'm going to take out number of cases. If you recall from the previous frequencies analysis, we calculated mean, variance, standard deviation, and then we had these skewness and kurtosis values as well. Okay. Um, from here, we can just say continue and OK. And then you'll see your means analysis is here. Okay, so using this, this navigation bar on the side, you can hop from test to test. And additionally, from parts of each test, right, um, based on where you want to go. Okay, so the means, we're going to get um, this case processing summary is going to tell us um, basically how many people were in our sample. That's kind of the only important thing that comes from that area. And then we get our report. Okay, so this is going to say based on the sport, right, this is the mean of number of push-ups that were achieved based on that particular sport, right? And the same thing for standard deviation, variance, kurtosis, and your skewness. Okay, again, we're going to talk about what these calculations mean because we haven't quite gotten there yet, but you'll get a chance to mess with this next week as well. Okay. So translating this information onto your answer sheet, okay, you're just describing which five calculations you chose for your frequencies analysis, how you identified or which independent variable versus dependent variable you chose um, in the means analysis, and they don't have to be the same as my example, okay, you can do whatever you want to. And then your critical thinking question for this spreadsheet or this task, right, is what is the main difference between a frequencies analysis and a means analysis and why would you want to use one over the other, okay? Um, so I gave you guys a hint, right, based on the results that the frequencies analysis and the compare means analysis give us considered how they are treating the data differently, right? How do they group data? And then when would we want to use grouped data versus ungrouped data? Okay. Um, so critically think about that. If you have questions, feel free to ask. Okay. Your submission checklist should include your answer sheet, your Excel spreadsheet that's completed, and your SPSS output. I'm going to show you how to save your SPSS output. What I would first recommend that you do is save the output as it exists as an SPV file. So I'm just going to save this on my desktop. Okay. And you can give it some name like activity to output. Okay. This will save as an SPV file. Okay. SPV files are not readable by Dropbox, but if you don't save this, you can't export it later. So I think it's a good idea just to keep this. That way you can edit components if you mess up for some reason or forgot to include a test. Okay. I would also recommend that you save your data set as well. Okay. This will save as an SAV file. So again, I'm going to save to my desktop. And I'm going to call this activity 2. I can't spell. Good gracious. Okay. SAV files are also not readable by Dropbox, but you don't need to submit this particular file. 
The only reason I say save this is because you put some work into formatting the variable view. So if, again, you messed up and you needed to redo your output, you already have everything organized and you don't have to do it over again. Okay? So I'm going to minimize this for now and we're going to work on exporting this output. Okay? You're going to go to File and you go to Export. Okay? From here you can choose different formats that you want to export your output as. Right? You can scroll through the list. Um, so you can uh, export to a PDF which is acceptable by um, Dropbox. You can do Excel 2007 and higher, which is the regular spreadsheet format, also acceptable by Dropbox. Or you could do a Word doc, okay? Um, in the past, I've always asked for PDFs, but Excel spreadsheets are actually easier to read. Reason being is that um, when you look at the output, sometimes tables are really big and on PDFs they jump to other pages. So Excel output I think is probably preferred. Okay. When you save it, make sure you click on browse so that you know where you're saving your stuff to because it will just save to wherever you previously saved your stuff. Okay, so like for this one, um, the last time I saved it was when I did a final exam output for the students. Okay, I don't want it saved there because that's not where I'm automatically going to look. So I'm just going to save it on my desktop. And again, I'm going to call it Activity 2. Okay. And if you've done this right, you should see the output and the data set that you've saved in that location. Okay. So just press Save and you press OK. And you are all done. Okay, so basically what you can do from here, la 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 la, I'm just going to take a sip of water. There we go. Basically once that's done, what I can show you is the hat on my desktop. Where did they go? This should have worked. Oh, goody. All right, on my desktop. Well, this is fun. They should have popped up here. I'm not sure why. I am the main user. Maybe I didn't double click it properly. That is a possibility. So let's try saving this again. Okay, we're gonna save as desktop. Maybe that's what I need, I need to double click on it. Um, so I'll save my data sheet and I'll save my output. I'm kind of glad I made that mistake. Do save as again. Again, we'll go into desktop, save, and then we'll also export. Again, um, yeah, this is under the user, not the actual desktop, so make sure you double click on whatever's in your desktop, right? Um, and then I'll just have to name it again, activity two. Okay, we'll go through the whole export process again. And then this should work this time. Fingers crossed. And then we'll be done. And you guys will have successfully successfully made it through week two. Alright. Aha, here they are. Okay. So again, the output that you're going to submit to SPSS is the Excel PDF or Word doc version, depending on what you want. But like I said, if tables are big, they translate better to Excel, so I can view all of them at the same time. Okay. Um, well, that's pretty much it. Okay, so you'll submit to Dropbox by next Monday at 11.59. And uh, obviously, the same as last week, you know, if you guys have any questions or if you can't figure something out on the Windows versions of Excel or SPSS, 
Please let me know I'm happy to make a short video and post it in the discussion section.